Hello. Um, so first of all, thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me and for putting on such an ambitious sort of programme um, during, uh, during this sort of pandemic. So I'm going to talk today about the number of data points one needs for semi-supervised learning, and particularly semi-supervised learning with the graph Laplacian. So let me start off by just saying, you know, what are the three main types of learning? So first of all, we have supervised learning. So this is given a fully labeled set of feature vectors to find a, um, to estimate the label from a, from either a new um, feature vector or from um, a, an, an existing feature vector. The second is uh, unsupervised learning. So now we're not given any labels at all, but rather we're trying to use geometric information to sort of um, extract clusters from, from a data set. And then the third type is the reinforcement learning, which I, I won't really touch on at all. So semi-supervised learning, which is the regime of this talk, can kind of lives between, uh, the, between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Okay, so what is it? So now we have a set of feature vectors xi from i from 1 to n and we have a subset of labels um, yi where i is indexed by this zn. So in supervised learning this zn would be the, the whole set of 1 up to n. In, in unsupervised learning this uh, zn would be the empty set. So in semi-supervised learning we're sort of in between so this is now just a, a subset, um, a non-empty subset. So what we're looking for is in what in some sense can be described as the best function from the set of feature vectors that agrees with our labeled data points. So of course I've got to tell you what do I mean by best. So okay so what would be the sort of a supervised classical approach? Well in the supervised approach we, we can't deal with unlabeled data points so essentially we would throw away the, the, the um, data points we don't have labels for and one would sort of approach this maybe as a regression problem doing something like minimizing the L2 norm of the gradients uh, subject to taking these, these conditions. Okay why do we think this is not going to be, be a sort of a, an optimal solution? Okay so this is a very toy example so that demonstrates where things where we can sort of gain um, sort of insight from our labeled data points. So let's say we have two labeled data points, a red one here and a blue one here. If this is the only two uh, feature vectors that I give you, and I ask you to partition the state space, then there's really kind of, you know, just one natural um, partitioning, that's just to draw a line in the middle, okay, and everything on this side gets is red, everything on this side is blue. Now, of course, if I give you some unlabeled data points, okay, like, like this, and then, okay, then I apply my, my rule, we can kind of see, okay, this is not, um, not, not an optimal solution and it would be much better if we move this line over okay and we partition where this sort of natural gap is. So this is what unsupervised, uh, sorry what semi-supervised learning is trying to do is we're trying to learn some of the geometry from the um, unlabeled data points okay and then combine this with the, the labels that we, that we know. Okay so how do we capture geometry? So in this talk it's all going to be through graphs. So our data set xi from i from 1 to m, uh, we'll assume this is sort of IID samples from some probability measure mu, and these are going to form the nodes of our graph. Between every two nodes, uh, we're going to place an edge, and we're going to weight this edge um, with weight wij, which is going to be some function of the distance between the two nodes. So this epsilon here plays the role of a, a length scale, and we'll, sort of just, we'll come back to this sort of very shortly. Um, Okay, so what's a typical example to have in mind? Well, a typical example to have in mind is something that eta is the indicator function um, over, over of the interval 0, 1. Okay, so particularly what this would mean is that if two data points here are closer than epsilon, okay, so I've, I've rescaled my eta epsilon to, to divide through by epsilon uh, here and then renormalized it. So if two data if two data points are closer than epsilon, then I have a positive weight, um, and if two data points are further than epsilon, then I have a zero, zero weight. So of course, this is just a prototypical example. I mean, one can be more sort of general and use things like Gaussian weights, um, but in general, this is the kind of the 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 choice to have in have in mind. Okay, then we we throw away all edges with zero weight, and we should be left with a much sparser sparser graph. So something I won't really talk too much about, but it is kind of implicit in everything that I say, is that one needs a lower bound on epsilon in order for this graph to be connected. You know, we can see here, if we choose epsilon to be too small, then, well, in a trivial case, we'll have no edges at all. Um, 
the theory really requires there to be um, the graph to be connected. Okay, and so this uh, this is approximately the lower bounds which we're going to need on on epsilon. Is that epsilon should be greater than the connectivity radius, and the connectivity radius is scaling something like log n over n to the dth power. <coughs> okay, so how does the choice of epsilon um, affect affect the solution? So let's consider this this sort of toy example where we have this these sort of two spirals. So I've labeled one point here yellow and one point here dark blue, and every other point is unlabeled. Now if I choose my epsilon to be quite large, so now you can see we have quite a lot of um, edges between these two spirals. Now I've applied some off-the-shelf um, uh, sort of classification tool, and what I see is that my sort of best uh, best uh, sort of cut is is the one that looks like this. So of course this isn't desirable, so we've, we've not managed to pick up the um, there are two spirals um, in our data. On the other hand, when epsilon is much smaller, now you can see there's, there's very few edges between these two um, these two spirals. Now we can we can pick up much better the sort of um, geometry. So in some sense, the smaller epsilon allows us to be allows us to find a resolution of our, of the data and allows us to kind of be, identify more easily that there are these sort of, uh, well, in this case, these are, there are the two two spirals. Okay, <clears throat> so we've already kind of sort of uh, sort of uh, stated the sort of the supervised classical approach and kind of said, okay, this isn't really the, isn't the right sort of problem to look at when we have unlabeled data points. So the the problem which we'll concern ourselves in this talk is the method that was proposed by Zhu Garamani and Lafferty, and then uh, generalised by Zhu and Schlockoff um, to general P, and this is to minimise this energy here. Okay, so this is uh, so this energy here is essentially a W1P semi norm, but now set on a graph. So what we do is we take we have our function fn here, and then we look at pairwise distances to the pth power and then weight by the by the graph uh, weight okay and then sum over all all edges and then here's just a normalization which will will come into um which will well will be important later <laughs> okay so the variational problem then is to consider what happens when we minimize this uh, this energy here over all functions that satisfy the constraints so the objective of this talk is to look at what happens when n goes off to infinity. And in particular, we care about, um, about um, what happens to the labels. So the first part of the talk is all going to be about when can we expect that this um, is a well-posed uh, limit when our, the size of our training data set is finite. The second part of the talk is going to be if we, if we allow our sort of data sets, well, in the case where this is this problem is is ill posed for finite number of uh, data points, can we can we still get a well posed limit if we let the size of this ZN here go off to infinity? Okay, so first of all, let's just formally uh, come up with what we expect the, uh, the large data limits to look like. So let's assume that xi are iid from some probability measure mu and mu has density rho. <coughs> Okay, so if I just uh, write what my, my discrete energy here is, so by definition, so what I've done here is, is substitute in the, uh, the weights, definition for the weights, which was given in terms of, we can be given in terms of this eta, then this is exactly, you know, the, the definition of this discrete, uh, discrete uh, energy. Okay, so now if I sort of formally say, well, if uh, n is very large, then I can replace this double summation with an integral with respect to the to measure mu, okay, which is density rho. So my double summation disappears, I get two integrals, and I get uh, I'm integrating with respect to sort of rho x and uh, rho y. Okay, a little sort of change of change of variables, I let z be equal to x minus y over epsilon. Okay, and this, this uh, sort of simplifies down slightly. And now, of course, you can see okay, we have this sort of pairwise distance here. And then we're dividing through by epsilon here. So of course we're expecting this to start looking like uh, a gradient when epsilon gets very small. So formally, this is a partial derivative in the direction of z. And, it, and similarly, if uh, if we assume that rho is continuous, then perturbing rho by epsilon z um, is 
approximately just going to be equal to to row of y. So I get sort of row row squared y here. Now I can sort of um, notice something here, and there's kind of a little trick we can play that since eta is uh, isotropic, then I can take one of these uh, these integrals out as a constant sigma eta, and I can leave then just the integration with respect to with respect to y. So this now is my sort of like candidate continuum limit. And of course, this now looks like um, well, it's just a weighted W1P seminar. So actually very similar to the sort of classical approach. But now, of course, we've, we've got this sort of density row. And this is of course where the, where the data sort of uh, comes into play. OK, so now let's let's look at the sort of the first case and say what happens when the size of my training data sets is equal to some capital M, which is fixed. OK, so of course, you know, if I look back at this problem here, if I, you know, if I just forget about this density row, then of course W1P is semi norm then we know we have no continuity unless P is strictly greater than D. So I, this problem, to minimize this, um, this energy E infinity P, doesn't even make sense unless P is bigger than the dimension of the space. So of course, I can, I can tell straight away that P greater than D is going to be a necessary condition um, for, for my problem to have a well-posed limit. So a well-posed limit in this case means that the uh, the uh, discrete minimize this, the, the discrete constrained problem is going to converge to a continuum constrained uh, problem. Okay, so the natural question then is: Well, is this enough? Do we need? Um, you know, can I just assume that p is greater than d and everything works, or do I need to assume more? So, quite interestingly, we do need to assume more. Okay, and this is a very simple counter example as to why we need to. Uh, why we need we need more than p being greater than d. So we have problems when spikes have low energy. So what is a spike? So a spike is something like this function here. Uh, so let's let fn of, fn of x1 be equal to 1 and fn of uh, xi be equal to 0 for other i, i greater than equal to 2. So this is a spike at the first data point. OK, and let's just look at what the energy of this uh, this function is. So if I stick this, this into my... Uh, my discrete energy, okay, then what I get is, okay, up to some normalization here, I just get the sum from j equals 2 to n of eta x1 minus xj over epsilon m. This is, of course, because uh, the sum over um, xi minus xj is just going to be um, b0 um, um, because, well, because fn of xi is equal to fn of xj when i and j are both greater than, greater than or equal to 2. Okay, so now let's let's look at how we expect this to behave. And again, let's think back to our prototypical example where this eta is just going to be an indicator function. So what this summation then is doing is it's counting the number of data points xj that are closer than epsilon to x1. Okay, so I can I can kind of tell how this this should scale. So the number of data points um, that are in the, in the ball of um, center x1 of radius epsilon, this is going to scale approximately as n times epsilon n to the d. Okay, this is of course well, epsilon n to d being sort of proportional to the volume of the ball, and then you know, we have we have n data points um, in total. So this is just a fraction that will fall within this ball. So in particular, I expect this red term here to be an order one parameter. So now I take I look at what I've got left over, and okay, the important uh, factor being this epsilon n to the p times n. So of course, if epsilon n to the p times n is going off to infinity, then this energy of this function here is going off to zero. So this spike then is paying no cost in the limit. So this is is bad because of course we can now we can know x1 was arbitrary. We can just put this at any uh, labeled data points, and of course this one here is arbitrary. And what we will then have is the sequences of uh, approximate minimizers that are converging to zero. <clears throat> okay, and this actually turned out to be a sort of a sharp example. So in particular, if epsilon n to the p times n is going off to infinity, it will turn out that this problem is that is, is ill-posed, as this sort of example demonstrates. And if epsilon n to the p times n is going off to zero, this actually will imply the problem is, is well-posed in the sense that constraints pass through to the limits. Okay, so we'll, we'll kind of come back to this later. Um, but first of all, we need to be, to be a bit more rigorous. We need, we need to kind of introduce a topology. So up to now, I've kind of said... Um, you know, I, I want my sort of discrete problem to be converged into a continuum problem, but of course, how do I compare my discrete problem to my continuum problem? My discrete problem uh, 
this function here fn is only defined on on the set of data points whereas if i go back to my um, sort of candidate um, function uh, um, energy for the continuum problem this this f here now is defined on a on, on the whole domain or at least a continuum domain Okay, so in order to kind of say, well, what does it mean for Fn to converge to F? Then of course I need, I need a topology in which I can compare both Fn and F. So there's kind of two choices here. So first thing we, we could think about doing is we could compare Fn with F restricted to the, to the discrete sets. But this has the disadvantage that we need F to be continuous. So, of course, if we want to do this in W1P, well, we would need P being bigger than D, otherwise we don't have continuity. Um, um, so, okay, so this this would kind of would only work in sort of special cases anyway. And, of course, um, this isn't going to be a metric space. I mean, it's, it's not symmetric, um, for example. Um, but it is conceptually simple. I mean, to compare Fn with the restriction of F is... You know, it's, it's not difficult to understand what this what this means. The second way is kind of the the opposite. So rather than restricting f to the discrete domain, we can extend f n to the whole domain omega. Okay, so in particular, we do this through what we call a transport map T n. So a transport map T n goes from omega to omega n, and this essentially partitions the domain. We then would define f n and tilde as being fn composed with tn so this fn tilde is now defined on the whole of omega okay and then we will just compare fn tilde with f and for example we could do this in like an lp no <clears throat> um the disadvantage how do we choose tn actually this isn't really a disadvantage because we can use sort of the theory of optimal transport to uh, to ch choose tn <clears throat> um okay but it has the advantages that we don't need to assume any sort of continuity now on on f. In particular, if we if we're comparing f and f until we're in LP, then there's no there's no need to assume that f is continuous. Um, and by choosing Tn sort of appropriately, then actually this this sort of option here defines that defines a metric. Okay, and the metric it defines is actually in the TLP space. So the TLP stands for transport in LP. Um, and the idea is really just to kind of uh, formalize the, the option two. Okay, so what we want to do, so the, this, the big sort of idea behind the TLP space is to include a space that's big enough to include both discrete and continuum, func uh, yeah, continuum functions. So we do this by treating, um, by treating functions as actually being pairs of functions so rather than think, thinking of fn and f on their own, we think of fn as being coupled with the measure mu n and f being coupled with the measure mu. So of course, you know, this could be any fn and any mu n, but of course we're thinking about these where mu n is a discrete measure uh, and mu is a continuum measure. But the key thing is that we only require fn to be sort of LP integral with respect to mu n, okay, and f be LP integral with respect to mu. Okay, so the TLP then space is defined as a space of couplings where mu is a probability measure and f is an LP um, integral with respect to mu. <clears throat> okay, and we can define a distance on this on this space, okay, as follows. So, okay, so the distance between f mu and g and nu will be, so we, we, we have sort of two components. So the first set of components is that we want that we'll compare f of x and g composed with t. Okay, and we do this in an LP norm. And the second thing is, because we don't want t to be too degenerate, we want t to be sort of well, close to x, we also penalize t of uh, t with the identity. Okay, and then this minimization is taking over all t, such that uh, t rearranges mu onto nu. So for those sort of familiar with optimal transport, they'll kind of recognize that this is very similar to the Wasserstein distance, which can be written sort of as follows. So in the Wasserstein distance, of course, you wouldn't have functions here. You just have the, the measures mu and nu. In that case here, you would, you would ignore this second term here and only treat the, the first term here. And this, this would, of course, would define the, the P-Wasserstein distance. Um, actually, there's kind of um, another sort of link between the two where one can actually see this uh, TLP distance as being the Wasserstein distance of the um, measures mu and nu pushed to the graphs of f and g and this allows for the theory to go through sort of immediately from the 
from the Wasserstein uh, so case. Okay, so this defines quite sort of a, you know, a complicated distance. In practice, it's much simpler. So this is a, a nice proposition by Nicholas Cartier Twillis and Diane Slepchev, who sort of introduced this space, and they also characterize it as follows. So if we assume that mu is absolutely continuous, then fm mu n converging to f mu in TLP is equivalent to saying that mu n converges to mu uh, weak star, and there exists a sequence of, of maps, Tn, uh, such that Tn pushes for uh, Tn pushes mu onto mu m, Tn is converging to the density in LP, and most importantly, Fn composed with Tn is converging to F in, in LP. So again, thinking back to our case where we're going to have mu n is going to be a discrete measure, well, this is going to happen um, as long as the data points are iid uh, with probability one, so we can kind of you know, almost forget about this. And then it just becomes about can we find this transport map which is okay, which is pushing the the right pushing the continuum measure onto the discrete measure and converging to a density such that Fn composed with Tn is converging to F. Okay, and this is a kind of a much simpler simpler requirement. Of course, this is for um for any um sequencer. Well, we just had to find one sequence of transport maps that, that satisfies this. Okay, the second tool we're going to use comes from the calculus of variations. It's going to be gamma convergence. So we're interested in uh, sequences of minimization problems. So gamma convergence is a very natural tool. Okay, so why is it a very natural tool? Well, let's consider kind of the following problem. So let's consider a, a functional, well, a sequence of functionals that are oscillating. So what we have here is, um, so we have some, the green curve here um, is sort of oscillating quite slowly. And then Okay, so this is kind of a problem indexed by n, and then um, I, I increase my n, and now my problem is increasing, uh, is oscillating more quickly. I'm asking, okay, what happens as I, as I, as I take n off to infinity? And particularly, what's happening to the minimizers and the minimum of this, uh, this variational problem? Okay, so I guess the first thing to note is that the minim the minimizers, the minimum, are all sort of well defined. I mean, they're all sort of uh, so the minimizers are sort of around somewhere around here, and the minimum as k is you know around well, I guess on this axis here around here. Okay, so maybe the most natural thing is to first of all say, okay, so is there a, is there a strong limit to this problem? Well, of course, no, there's not. We're oscillating, so um, it doesn't make sense to ask for a strong limit. Maybe the second thing to ask for, well, okay, is there a weak limit? Well, yes, there is a weak limit. So the weak limit is this red curve here. Okay, so it's nice that it's well defined, but we can see that if we're interested in the minimizers and the minimum, it's in the wrong place. So the minimizers and the minimum are over over here for the weak limit, but they're over here for the um, for the, the, the for the for the sequence. Um, Okay, so this then isn't the right notion of convergence. What is the right notion of convergence? Well, that would be the gamma limit. So the gamma limit is this black curve here, and we can see here the minimizers and the minimum are in the right place. And in sort of a formal sense, this uh, the gamma limit is the limiting lower semi-continuous envelope of the um, of this of the sequence. Okay, so more formally, we can write gamma convergence um, as being the these the limit f infinity that satisfies these two inequalities so the first one just says you know, for all fn converging to f the gamma limit is is a lower bound um on on the sequence okay and then the second uh, inequality says that this lower bound is kind of uh, the greatest lower bound possible so in particular we can find a sequence um, such that we we actually achieve the, the lower bound Okay, but the theorem is, is what's important here, and this is kind of what this picture promises you, that if we have uh, take a sequence, okay, little fn of almost minimizers of uh, calligraphic fm, then as long as we assume that fn are pre-compact, and that this and that the um, sequence of um, functionals has a gamma limit, which is not identically not identically equal to plus infinity, then we have that the minimum um, converges. Um, the minimum okay minimum of the of these fn's converges to the minimum of this f tilde and furthermore any sequence of fn that's converging will converge to a minimizer of f infinity okay so hidden in here is is a topology so the topology comes into how what we mean when we say that fn is converging to f 
So if you think back to the previous slide in the TLP topology, this topology here is now going to be given by the TLP uh, metric. So this, these FNs here are going to be our discrete, our discrete functions on the graph, and these Fs here are going to be functions on a, on a sort of open domain. <clears throat> okay, so this um, theorem here basically combines the sort of gamma convergence with uh, with this sort of the TLP. So we let Fn be sequence of minimizers of our, this was our sort of um, sublog W1P um, semi-norm on the graph. And we assume it has N constraints. And we also assume that epsilon N satisfies this lower bound, which is essentially just gives us connectivity of the graph. Then with probability one, Fn is converging in TLP along subsequences to some F in W1P. Okay, so we we have convergence. So we know that our kind of our problem is is going to converge to something. The question now is is what are we going to converge to? So we have two re regimes. So the first one is the well posed regime. So this is if epsilon n is satisfying this uh, this upper bound, then we have that the whole sequence f n is actually converging to f locally uniformly. So this is a much stronger type of convergence than uh, just converging in TLP. Okay, and moreover, f is going to be a minimizer of uh, this this um, continuum um, energy infinity p subject to the constraints. So this is why we call this the well posed regime because we got we have constrained minimizers converging to constrained minimizers. The second uh, case, of course, is the ill posed regime. This now says that if epsilon n is scaling much bigger than n to, n to the power of minus one over p, then f is going to be a constant. So, of course, if f is a constant, then we're not respecting the constraints. So another way of saying this is that um, these fn's are converging to uh, a minimizer of e infinity p without constraints. Because, of course, any constant function is a minimizer of, of e infinity p, which is just a w1p seminal. Okay, there are sort of several other results in this sort of, uh, sort of area. Um, so I kind of include some references uh, here. Okay, so let me kind of give you some sort of numerical results to kind of see, so you can see what's sort of going on. So I use, uh, so this is now a, a two-dimensional problem. So I need to get to well posed result. I need to choose P being bigger than two. So I just choose P being equal to four. Okay, now this problem here has, I look at two constraints. So I have uh, one constraint here. So the function has to take the value, the value zero here and has to take the value one, one here. And I've just used the uniform density. So this is what happens when I minimize my continuum problem. And you can see, you know, it's, um, uh, this is what it looks like. Okay, now if I sample my data okay, uniformly, um, I choose my epsilon to be, this is fairly small. I can't take it much smaller than that without the graph becoming disconnected. And I look at what the minimizer looks like. Um, you can see that, you know, looking at stuff eyeballing between the two, the, between the continuum and discrete, they look fairly close. So I hope, hopefully you can kind of believe that um, this thing here is going to, you know, is converging to, to this thing, this thing here. <clears throat> okay, now let's look at what happens if we zoom in sort of around one of these labeled data points here. So I'll zoom in around here and I'll play with this epsilon. Okay, so this is epsilon, roughly the same epsilon as we had in the slide before. And you can see, okay, we, we do get like a very small spike here, but it's not particularly sort of noticeable. So, okay, so this picture here, right, just to remind you, is just zoomed in around here. Now, if I make epsilon bigger, you can see the spike here gets bigger. I make epsilon even bigger and the spike here gets bigger still. So what you can see is that as epsilon gets bigger, this, um, we're kind of becoming more degenerates. Okay, and this kind of supports the, the the theorem a couple of slides ago, which says that um, says that there has to be an upper bound on epsilon. So here we're kind of passing from the well posed regime where epsilon is quite small to the ill posed regime where epsilon is quite big, even though my my choice of p is bigger than the dimension of the space. Okay, so I kind of if I go back to the theorem. The proof of the ill-posed regime really just follows by from the example I had before where I, I built a, a spike and then I looked at the energy of this spike. So let me now kind of give you some intuition on how this sort of well-posed regime works. And the key sort of uh, step is to notice that the discrete energy 
is not behaving like the continuum energy, but it's behaving like the continuum energy after modification. Okay, so in particular, let me define my sort of Fn tilde to be, okay, so Fn composed of Tn, okay, where Tn is sort of you know, optimal or close to optimal. So this Fn tilde is now a continuum uh, function. Okay, and then there exists some, some modifier J, which can kind of be built from the, um, from the, from the, the graph uh, kernel eta. <clears throat> okay, so then, then the the step is is claiming that if I modify my fn tilde with this with this j on on the scale of epsilon m, then this is approximately equal to the discrete energy. So the the key, the key observation here is that this discrete energy here isn't controlling the continuum energy of fn tilde. It's controlling the continuum energy of fn tilde after it's been modified on the scale of epsilon. Okay, our second step then is to, so this, okay, so this first step here kind of gives control of Fn tilde over the length scales greater than epsilon. So our second step then is to control the um, control the regularity of this Fn tilde over scales sort of on on the level of epsilon. So we can do this um, kind of with the following sort of calculation. So we define an oscillation of Fn on the scale of epsilon at the point xk just to be the maximum of this function in the ball of at xk of radius epsilon minus the minimum of the function on the ball of xk um, of radius epsilon. So this is just the maximum minus the minimum the, fu the function can take over over uh, some ball. It's a little bit of algebra, but then one can kind of show that this is can, can be bounded above by some constant times n times epsilon n to the p times the, the discrete energy to the p root. Okay, so this, of course, now if we're thinking that this Fn is going to be a minimizer, an approximate minimizer, then we know that this, this E and uh, P Fn is going to be bounded. So what happens to this sort of oscillations is really is completely determined by what happens to N times epsilon N to the P. <clears throat> okay, so in the regime where N times epsilon N to the P is going off to zero, which is exactly what we needed to, to assume for the, um, for the well-posed regime, then we know that the oscillations also have to be going to zero. So we can combine then the, these first two steps, um, which will give us control over length scales greater than epsilon and control at length scales at epsilon to get sort of um, a uniform convergence over the whole, um, over, over all scales. Okay, so in particular, it's kind of a sub of embedding of this sort of um, modified function. Okay, then, then we sort of argue with the, with the control of oscillations, we can, get, we can get sort of uniform convergence, which is kind of what you would expect um, from the, from the sub of embeddings. <clears throat> okay, so this now gives us a very strong notion of, of uh, convergence, and actually this then is not to kind of pass, uh, pass constraints through to the limit. So in case in particular, we can try show that the, that uh, these discrete energies gamma converge to the continuum energies, plus we have a compactness result, okay, which then will imply uh, convergence of minimizers and convergence of minimum. And this the gamma convergence and the um, compactness, these really follow from the uh, result by uh, Nicholas Garthia Twillis and Diane Slepchev, who they actually did this with, uh, in the case P equals one, but it's no difference to this with, uh, with any P. <clears throat> Okay, so what do people do in practice? So in practice, I would say the most uh, popular choice is P equals two. So of course this can be solved explicitly, you know, it's nice and quadratic. Um, but our results say that this is going to be ill-posed if you have finitely many constraints, um, unless you're in one dimension, which of course you're not normally going to be in one dimension. So then the question is, well, how can we kind of uh, get a, a well-posed result when P equals two? So, I mean, there's, there's several sort of different methods here. So the first approach, so this was, um, is, is to increase the weight around labels. So essentially, you know, you're, you're trying to enforce more regularity at the label points. And there's you know, been a, a few papers on this now. So she, Osha, and Zhu, and she, Wang, and Osha, uh, the, sort of the UCLA crowd, they've, uh, they were the first ones to propose this, and they've written a couple of papers about this. and. Uh, Jeff Calder and Dan Sepchev, they've also looked, uh, looked into this method as well. 
Okay, the second possible approach is to kind of uh, fix the ill posedness in the equation. Okay, and actually when one does this, you kind of uncover this a certain bias. And this actually is quite, a, uh, well, I think it's a nice approach because I was one of the authors. Um, but this actually leads to um, an equation called Poisson learning. Um, so something that I haven't really mentioned so far is that the the solution minimizing these um, Sobolov um, to be 1p, semi-norms, one gets the Laplacian equation. Once you kind of uh, fix the ill posedness, you actually end up with something that's like a, a Poisson um, equation. So, okay, so these are two sort of possible ways of uh, approaching the, this problem. I won't talk about either of these um, in the remainder of the talk. Instead, I'm going to talk about um, a third approach, and that is to take the number of labels off to infinity. So the idea is with, with more labels, we you know we should end up with a well posed problem. And of course, if we have that, um, so Zn is the number of label points, if Zn is proportional to n, then of course we're going to end up with uh, constraints over some um, over a subset, um, you know, an, an open subset. And of course, this is a well posed uh, well posed problem. Um, then the question is, okay, can we take Zn to be less than the number, less than proportional to n? So I, I'll change the sort of model slightly to um, kind of better investigate this. So. Let us recall that x i and y i. This is the okay the, the training data point, or maybe we should say the labeled uh, data point. So x i are star feature vectors, y i are our labels. Okay, and i is in, in z n. Um, what I will assume is that the the probability of data point uh, i being labeled is equal to some some beta uh, times the indicator function of um, of uh, uh, omega tilde. So we think of this as being, so omega tilde is some um, open and bounded subset of, of omega. If a data point falls inside that, um, inside omega tilde, then we have a probability beta that it's going to be labeled. So if our, our training, uh, if our, our feature vector falls outside omega tilde, it's not labeled. If it falls inside omega tilde, it is labeled, but we, it could be labeled with probability beta and it could not be labeled with probability one minus beta. Okay, and I include an n here because I'm particularly interested in saying, okay, how small can we can we take this, this beta? Um, so if beta is just a constant, then of course the number of, of training, uh, number of labeled points is going to be proportional to n. But the idea is we want to go below, below this sort of linearity. Okay, if our training, if our our data point is uh, labeled, then we define the label to be equal to some function g, g dagger, okay, at, at x i. So what does it mean to be well posed? Okay, so well posed would say that minimizes of the uh, this discrete energy subject to the constraints are converging to minimizes of e infinity p subject to f of x equal to g dagger x for all x in omega tilde. Our ill-posed case would say that minimizers of the discrete energy okay, with constraints are converging to constants. So what we want to know is um, for, what, uh, for what scaling on beta are we in the well-posed case and for what scaling of beta are we in the ill-posed case. Okay, um, and then maybe let me say, so for the well-posed case, we'll only consider the case p equals 2. For the ill-posed case, we'll actually consider any p being greater than 1. Okay. So first of all, let me give you the result for the ill-posed regime. So if P is strictly greater than one, epsilon N satisfies the lower bound, okay, which is just a connectivity radius. We let Fn be a sequence of minimizers of um, ENP, satisfying the constraints. Now let me assume that beta N is scaling to zero much faster than epsilon N to the P, okay, and N times epsilon N to the P over log N is much uh, greater than one. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then I have that so with probability one, this Fn is pre-compact and any convergent subsequence is converging to a constant. So let me sort of quickly maybe sort of uh, talk about these two assumptions here. So this assumption here is very natural given the theorem a few slides ago. So I actually know that if n times epsilon to the p over log n is going, um, is going to zero, then actually I know my problem is well posed with finitely many constraints. So of course it's going to be, um, is going to be well posed with um, 
you know no matter um how how quickly to zero um beta goes so the interesting part really is this this beta here um <clears throat> Okay, so the, the proof of this theorem actually really follows the same lines as the proof of the ill post result for finite mini constraints in that we just construct spikes and we show that if we don't, as long as we don't have too many spikes, that our energy is, is still going to be, uh, it's still going to go to zero and it turns out the number of spikes you need. So the, so the total number of constraints you have is going to be approximately n times beta n. Okay, so then it turns out that what you need um, is, um, yeah, you, you have to have much less than n times epsilon n to the p constraints, and you can actually see this from the um, from the calculation I showed sort of several slides ago. Okay, so we also have a well-posed regime. So this is only when p equals two. Epsilon is satisfying the usual lower bounds. Fn is going to sequence that minimizes the ENP, satisfying the constraints. In the case, this is just EN2, of course. Um, now we let f be the minimizer of e infinity p with constraints. We'll assume the opposite um, sort of uh, inequality here. So here we have beta n has to be much smaller than epsilon n to the p. Now we have beta n is much greater than epsilon n to the p. So this is now a lower bound on, on the number of uh, constraints we have. Okay, and then actually we need um, a slightly stronger uh, uh, lower bound. Um, okay, which here, which this is okay, just for kind of um, for technical technical reasons. Okay, but under these assumptions, then we have almost surely that f n is converging to f uh, uniformly. Um, okay, which means that if I take my f, I restrict it to the to the set of data points, and then I compare this with my f n. This is converging to zero. Okay, so this this now means that. Um, now my my fn is converging to okay so let me put it like this that minimizers of emp emp with constraints are converging to minimizers of e infinity p with constraints so this will be the well posed um, this is why we call this a well posed regime so in the rest of the talk I'm going to kind of give you some intuition on how this proof here works so the first thing I want to say before I get into the proof is um, it's introduced these to introduce the graph Laplacian and the continuum Laplacian. So I've already mentioned Laplacian I think several times in this talk and I actually haven't said what it is so far. So now's a good time to do so. So the graph Laplacian um, we define, so in the, if you look in the literature, so the normalization isn't very important, um, but the, 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 the key step is that we're taking um, the graph Laplacian of this Fn is looking at pairwise distances. Um, okay, so we're evaluating the point x i, then we're summing over the point x j, and then we weight by the, the weights w i j. Okay, why is this? Uh, why do we care? Well, we, we care because the minimizers of uh, Fn of uh, of en two with the constraints satisfy this Laplace equation. So the graph Laplacian of f has to be equal to zero at the unlabeled data points, and the Laplacian and Fn has to be equal to the, the labels at the, at the label data points. This has a continuum analog. So the continuum analog is the, um, okay, we have the weighted Laplacian where there's density rho. So of course, if rho is one, then this is the, the regular Laplacian. Okay, and this is just the, the, the weighted Laplacian is just defined as one over rho times the divergence of rho squared uh, grad f. Okay, and now of course the um, this corresponds to the continuum problem in the following um, the following sense. So we have minimizers um, minimizers f of the uh, of the continuum sort of um, energy. Okay, with constraints they will satisfy. So the Laplacian of f has to be equal to zero um, away from omega tilde. F has to be equal to g dagger on omega tilde, and we have a a Neumann uh, boundary condition on the, okay, on, on the boundary of, of omega. Okay, so we will sort of um, use this um, uh, this sort of um, way of writing down sort of the, the minimizers. In particular, we sort of use the fact that the discrete and the continuum minimizers solve um, solve uh, that there was these are, these are passing type equations when we're trying to prove this uh, this theorem this theorem here. Okay, and the reason why it only works for p equals two is because we make explicit use of the random walk interpretation of minimizers, which it only holds for p being equal to two. So, 
let me let uh, gn be the graph with edge weights uh, w. I'll let xt of uh, little x. This is going to be my random walk on omega n. So I will start this random walk from some some arbitrary point x in omega n, which I which I will choose. And then I transition from point uh, say xl to xk with a probability proportional to the weight of the edge between the uh, between the node xl and xk. I will define the stopping time as being the first time the random walk hits a labeled data point. Okay, and what one can show, and this is a very quick and easy calculation, is that if I define uh, my a function fn to be the expected label of the uh, when this random walk stops. Okay, so I start my random walk at x. I stop this random walk as soon as it hits a labeled data point, and then I look at the label, which would be g dagger. Then, okay, the function defined in this way is actually a minimizer of um, of my um, of my energy when p equals two, subject to the constraints. Okay, so this then is the characterization which we'll use to to prove the um, theorem. And since you know the intuition it is actually fairly straightforward in that all we're going to want to do is we want to show that this stopping time here is not going to be too too big. And we want to kind of show that this um, as long as um, we've not taken too many to steps to stop, that the random walk can't have gone too far. Okay, so step one is to show that um, this, uh, this random walk behaves um, Okay, approximately as a random walk would on a continuum domain. Okay, so in particular, one can actually show that if we start at x, then with you know high probability, I'm not going to take um, more. I'm not going to have traveled further than square root of k times epsilon um, in in k steps. Okay, so epsilon is you know approximately the size of a step. Okay, so if I take k steps, then I expect to move the distance no more than square root of k times epsilon, and this is with some probability. So I put an alpha here so that I can put an, uh, I can make this sort of arbitrarily small. <clears throat> okay, my step two is that I just look at what happens within the label domain. So if I start off in the interior of the label domain, then I have a probability sort of beta of stopping it at each time step. Because I know that the, you know, approximately sort of um, beat, you know, the proportion of la of data points that are labelled within the domain omega tilde um, is, is is equal to beta. Okay, so the probability of um, stopping in in one step is going to be beta. The probability of so the probability of not stopping is going to be sort of one minus beta. Okay, so then I can kind of you know do this argument by induction and say okay the probability that I'm going to take more than k steps to uh, k steps to to stop is going to be less than one minus okay, some some constant times beta to the power of k, okay, which I can kind of bound again by e to the minus c k beta, and this argument now holds for any x in in the omega tilde, but not outside, of course, because outside I have no no label data points. Okay, so now I can combine these the previous two steps. <coughs> And I can say, you know, for any for any x which is within the sort of uh, labeled domain, that if I look at the distance between f n of x and g dagger of x, okay. So first of all, I just use my my expression for f n of x in terms of the expected value of the stopping time. Then I can bound it by the expected value of uh, g dagger of the random walk minus g dagger. Okay, at where, wherever we start. Okay, so now I condition on the event that the stopping time is less than or equal to k. Okay, so then I, I get two terms here. Okay, so now if I look at my sort of step one and my step two. So first of all, this blue term here, the probability that um, s of x is greater than k, well, I know this is going to be quite small here. And okay, I kind of have no control over, over this thing here because this um, x of s of x at x um, could be very far away from x, but still, if I assume my g dagger is on infinity, then I can I can put um, sort of an order one bound here, and then here I'm going to have my bound um, e to the minus ck beta. Okay, kind of conversely on for the red term here, that this uh, this this term here, the probability that the stopping time is less than k. Well, this is this is actually hopefully quite. 
quite big. So I can just bound this by one. And then I can look at this term here. Well, okay, if G dagger is Lipschitz, then I can pull this out. And all I really have to care about is the distance between X of S of X um, minus X. Okay, and if my stopping time is less than equal to K, well, again, I can I can bound this by the um, my X of uh, K at X minus uh, K G dagger of X. And I can take advantage of this bound here to say, okay, I expect this, thing, this to be less than alpha times square root K times epsilon. Okay, so what I have this bound here, and this is true for any k at this point here. But now what I can do is I can choose my k optimally. Okay, and you can either do this calculation yourself or you can just believe me that k should effectively be one over beta, okay, times some sort of logarithmic terms. Okay, and this then gives you a high probability bound that uh, f of x minus g dagger of x is less than or equal to some constant times epsilon over square root of beta, the logarithmic terms. So this actually gives us more than what I said in the theorem. This actually gives us a rate of convergence um, as well. At least at this point, this is only on the domain uh, omega tilde. Now we have to extend this result to the to the whole domain omega. Um, okay, so to do this, we're going to have to look at, um, at uh, pointwise convergence of the graph Laplacian. So this result um, here is a slight generalization of results that appeared so previously in the literature. Um, okay, so in particular, what we have is so this um, this ln epsilon is going to be the, the graph Laplacian, and this this l is uh, going to be a continuum Laplacian. And what we have is that the graph Laplacian is approximately equal to the continuum Laplacian plus boundary conditions. Okay, up to some error, which is. Um, bounded by you know, epsilon plus var theta, where var theta is is anything I want it to be between epsilon and one over epsilon, and kind of use controls to the probability. So the difference between this result and previous results is that we have, uh, we have boundary conditions. Okay, now let me look at, um, <clears throat> look at, uh, uh, at a function f, okay, which, which solves the Laplacian of f is equal to zero, okay, and f, okay, on the an omega but not an omega tilde, let f be equal to g dagger in omega tilde, and then let's assume this uh, this uh, Neumann uh, boundary condition, okay, and let's let also let phi solve a similar problem, but now we say the Laplacian of uh, phi is equal to one, okay, um, outside of omega tilde. Phi is going to be equal to zero in omega tilde, and we'll have a a uh, Neumann boundary condition. But now, okay, but we've got one here, not a, not a zero. Okay, and I'll choose v to be equal to f plus some constant m, which I'll choose shortly times var theta um, phi. Um, this will be on the uh, outside of omega tilde, and I'll choose to be g dagger on omega tilde. So this v is going to be a barrier function. Um, <clears throat> okay, by choosing m large enough, I have the following. Um, I can say that, <clears throat> okay, so if I just apply my graph Laplacian to v, okay, so everything's nice and linear, then I'm just applying my graph Laplacian to f and my graph Laplacian to phi times this sort of um, m times v r theta. And now, of course, I can take uh, advantage of uh, the pointwise convergence results, and I can sub exchange the um, the, uh, the the graph uh, Laplacian for the continuum Laplacian. Okay, up to some error, which is going to be a order you know, epsilon plus phi theta. Okay, of course, I know that Laplacian of f is equal to zero, so this disappears, and I know that Laplacian of um, of far thi is equal to one. So I can sort of ignore this term here. I just have this is equal to m times r theta plus some error. And now make sure I choose my m big enough that this is going to be positive. Okay, so what can I do now? Well, I can now use the maximum principle. So if I look at the graph Laplacian of fn minus v, okay, so of course the graph Laplacian of fn is going to be zero. So this is actually just equal to the minus the, the graph Laplacian of, of v, which okay, by this is going to be negative. So the maximum principle then will tell me that the maximum of fn minus v on omega is actually going to be achieved on omega tilde. Okay, omega tilde is exactly the set uh, where I can control the uh, this, this this 
the difference between FN and uh, G dagger. Okay, sorry, so I actually I missed a step here. So this V here on omega tilde is just going to be equal to G dagger, because that's how I defined it. And now, of course, um, on the set of omega tilde, it's exactly where I can control FN minus G dagger. So by one of the previous steps, I know that this is less than um, epsilon over square root of beta times some constant times some logarithmic terms. Um, I can do exactly the same argument for um, V minus FN rather than FN minus V, and I'd end up with an L infinity norm, okay, which um, again is, is just the same as the, um, the bound, um, bound here. <clears throat> Okay, so since uh, var of thi of L infinity is less than uh, some some constant, then now I can just apply to the triangle inequality, and what I get is that um, fn fn minus okay fn minus f is going to be less than or equal to fn minus v plus v minus uh, f, and of course if I look back what my uh, what my okay how my v and f are defined, then V minus F is just going to be okay, some constant times var band by some constant times var theta. <clears throat> okay, and I think somewhere I think I must have chosen var theta to be epsilon over square root of beta. Sorry. Okay, so in summary, um, in the graph-based semi-supervised learning P Laplace methodology, uh, we showed that if P is less than or equal to D, the method is asymptotically ill-posed for finite constraints. And this is this is always always true. Um, if P is greater than D, the method is either asymptotically ill-posed or well-posed for finite constraints, depending on how large epsilon is. Okay, and then we further can consider the model when uh, when P is equal to two. And we showed that um, for the model to be asymptotically well posed, one needs a uh, needs a lower bound uh, on the number of labels. Okay, and this lower bound really just comes directly from from here. So one just needs that um, beta is uh, is much greater than epsilon epsilon squared. Okay, so with that, I will conclude my talk. The set of several references, so a lot of these references are from sort of, um, the people that have worked on this problem. Uh, my sort of results in, in are sort of our heights, it's um, in bold. So the first result was, was me and Diane Slepchev. Okay, and this is in this paper, in the um, Science Journal Mathematical Analysis paper. And the second result, uh, was me, Diane, and, and Jeff Calder, and this is a paper that you can find on, on archive. So with that, uh, thank you very much.